Palm Sunday, welcome. Appreciate you all coming down on this day. We'll be in Zacharias chapter 9, looking at verse 9. And this particular scripture deals with Jesus entering into Jerusalem 500 years earlier, prophesying exactly to the day that Jesus would enter into Jerusalem. Now, Palm Sunday is about Jesus entering Jerusalem on a donkey. And what a silly picture that is to see a king on a donkey. Don't you think that's silly? A king that has power and authority, and he's sitting on a donkey, riding into Jerusalem. I believe it was Emperor Nero who fought a war with the Pathians, and he lost. And then there was a rebellion in Judea, AD 67, near the end of his reign there, which would eventually lead to the siege of Jerusalem in AD 70 and the destruction of the temple. Now, if you can imagine Emperor Nero battling these wars, these battles, and then sitting on a donkey? It's silly to think about that. I think it was George Washington who was probably the most important figure in America. His fame uh, grew during the French and Indian War and then led, he led the uh, continual um, Continental Army during the American Revolutionary War. And we see lots of pictures of George Washington, and usually he's by a, a white horse. Can you imagine a donkey next to him? That's silly looking. And yet we have Jesus riding into Jerusalem, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and he's on a donkey. What a silly picture. As a man, I wouldn't like it. Put me on a horse, a black one, or a white horse with, with a long mane that I can grab hold of. Forget the saddle, you know, and ride in there like a man. But no, he was on a donkey. And we call it the triumphal entry. Oxymoron doesn't seem like it's very triumphal wouldn't make the news headlines, right? That, w that term, triumphal entry, is a term that originated with the Romans. It was when they won a battle and they had a civil ceremony and religious rites and they awarded this great ceremony where a king would ride in on a horse and it was a triumphal entry and everyone was celebrating this great king's uh, victory. So we come to Zacharias 9.9, 500 years or so uh, earlier before Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, the coat, the fold of a donkey. The two phrases, daughter of Zion and daughter of Jerusalem, speaks and represents all of Israel, the whole nation. So this word is for Israel, for God's chosen people. And it speaks to every Jewish man and woman out there that they are to behold. There's that word again, that emphatic behold. They should be excited. They should be cheering. They should be uh, expecting this situation to happen here real soon where the king or the Messiah will come to you and he is just having salvation with him or one in the Hebrew who brings salvation, the only one who brings salvation. There is no other way to get to heaven but through Jesus Christ because he's the way, truth, and life. No one can get to the Father except through him, John 14, 6 tells us. There is only one mediator between God and man and that man is Jesus Christ. He had to be the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. It was through him that salvation was brought to all of humanity, and he would be riding in on a donkey. Now, Zechariah's prophecy or prophetic work here was to administer consolation. He was to bring encouragement and um, comfort to the people, especially since they just got back from captivity of Babylon, and they began to rebuild the temple, and so they were being, um, in a sense, persecuted and losing heart in the work that God was doing in their lives. And so Zechariah's job was to encourage them, kind of like a pastor. You know, I have to encourage you to get busy, encourage you to stay busy with the Lord's work, encourage you in life, you know, uh, keep you on track and, and stay the course, as Chuck would always say, and keep your focus on Jesus completely. Uh, no wonder they called him the prophet of hope, the prophet of hope. Good name to have, right? The temple was probably about halfway built here, and they needed to stay busy. They needed to focus. They needed the temple complete. Without the temple, the Messiah couldn't come in to bring that salvation. People were hurting at that time. 
you can imagine the baggage that they had from the captivity itself. And then finally, maybe coming back into their homeland and seeing the destruction that was there, having to rebuild it all, having to work. We don't like work, first of all. <laughs> That's always hard. We're cutting your grass and pulling weeds is hard, especially when you've been doing it for 30 years. You know, when's this going to end? <laughs> you know, never until you die. You know, weeds will always grow. In fact, they grow better than grass. <laughs> they grow better than flowers. I wish we would change our mentality and think weeds look beautiful and flowers are ugly. <laughs> that would be nice and easier. It would be less work anyway. But people are hurting. They're hurting even today. There's a lot of pressures in life today. Uh, struggles in our relationships, struggles at work, struggle with life itself, with doubts, with worries and cares. And we really need comfort, don't we? We need hope. And that's the responsibility of the church, responsibility of God. And when God brings us hope, when God brings us comfort, we're to comfort one another with that same comfort. Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He's the God of all comfort. When we almost lost this building, <coughs> that was a time of discomfort. <coughs> it was a time of stress. We got on our knees and we were praying. We had nowhere to go. We tried some schools. It was going to cost money. We'd have to travel every week. We'd have to cut out Wednesday nights. So we weren't looking forward to doing that. No buildings in the area th that could fit the size that we were for the money that we had. And so you can just imagine the stress. I mean, I was under stress just from the fact of, are you done with me, Lord? Here, you, 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 you had me quit my job a couple of years earlier, and now you're done with me? Why couldn't I have kept my job? At least I would have had a, a, you know, a career <laughs> and could have made it and survived, but here you're cutting me off? Are you saying we're done, we're over, and the church is going to disperse and people will go to harvest in other places? You know, it's not right, Lord. I mean, it was stressful. It was stressful. But then the Lord came through. We prayed, we sought Him, we, we, we tried as hard as we could to control our emotions and feelings of worries and cares and just continually putting it at the feet of Jesus, and He came through. Uh, the, the owner came in, and he was convicted of his sins and, and of what he was about to do to us, and so he became, in a sense, an advocate for us, and he helped us purchase the place by lowering the amount, and God just began to put pieces together, and boom, now we own the place, and I'm still here. Thank you, Lord. He's still using me. There's still hope. And that brought us comfort. Now we take that comfort and we tell others that God's working. It may not seem like it because we went for a whole year of this not knowing what was going on. And it may be that you're going through this for a year or two or three. But know this, God is working behind the scenes. He has a plan and he has a purpose. Be comforted in him. He knows what he's doing. He has mercies for you. He's a God of all mercy and comfort who comforts us all in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort by which we ourselves were comforted by God. So when we're comforted, we comfort others also. Be comforted. Be comforted. Have hope. But get busy with the kingdom too, right? That was Zachariah's whole purpose. Uh, stop focusing on yourself. Stop focusing on the situation. Don't look at the devastation. Don't look at how people are scattered all over. Stay focused on God and just keep building the temple. We need to focus on that. We need to focus on God and nothing else. That, that seems so simple, doesn't it? It is simple, but it's so difficult because we have feelings, we have emotions, and it's hard to bring those things under control. I'm 50 three i'll be 54 in six months that's old at least i think it's old i know some of you are looking you're just a kid you know, i hear that all the time you're just a kid i think back to all the things that i've gone through even with my wife at the age of 13 when we met and some of the struggles that we had in our relationship even through high school and, and so forth and i i can look back and see how god has always been there in all those instances and I can see that he's always shown up right at the point where I have totally given up. And he's been faithful to do that. And so today I should be able to say, no big deal. Hey, yeah, I feel it here, my emotions, but God's going to show up. And it's easier today than it was 20 years ago 
or 10 years ago, but it's still difficult, isn't it? It's easy to say, I trust in the Lord. I just trust in the Lord. Uh, that's very pious of us when someone else comes up to us and says, how are you doing? Well, I'm struggling, but I'm trusting in the Lord. And you're inside, you're going, oh, I hate this. You know, I don't like it. And yet it's, it, it's taking those emotions and just casting them before the Lord. Zacharias had begun his ministry of compassion uh, two months after that of Haggai, a contemporary of his there. Uh, which lasted about two years. Um, Ezra tells us that he was associated with him in engaging the people to rebuild the temple despite of the um, difficulties that were taking place at the time. The temple was finally finished in the sixth year of Darius, 515. And the latter part of Zechariah was probably the part where he wrote chapter 9, verse 9, to rejoice greatly. Because behold, your king is coming. He is just and having salvation, lowly riding on a donkey. And so they were to re rejoice. And kind of ironic that they finished the temple and now it's ready for Jesus 500 years later to come into Jerusalem and be that king of peace. Interesting that Zechariah's name's one, name means one who, whom Jehovah remembers. Whom Jehovah remembers. If you go back to Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and some of those Old Testament books, and you look at the captivity of Babylon, he, he promised them that they would be taken into captivity for 70 years, but that he would not forget. I'm sure at the 69th year, they're thinking, oh, he forgot. <laughs> it was 69 years, one more year to go. Hang on for one more year. And he remembered. And he was able to uh, allow them to come back to their homeland, return from that bondage, just as he said. And so here's Zacharias with the name, one whom Jehovah remembers. The Lord remembers. God will never forget the Jews. They're always on his mind. They're always on his mind. Uh, they're a special people to him. He loves them very much in spite of the hatred that people have towards them. Obama just Monday night demanded Israel to give up their land to the Palestinians. Uh, one of his representatives uh, bluntly said in a warning that its occupation of Palestine uh, must end, must end. There's a hatred of Israel, and yet God doesn't forget them. God loves them. An article that was in the Times of Israel by Francisco Gil White, he mentioned some quotes which I thought were interesting concerning Iran, and we know that's where the struggle is at this moment, is Iran trying to get <coughs> nuclear weapons, and Obama trying to help them, thinking that they'll keep their part on the peace plan when we know they will not. And I, I you got to be really stupid to think they will. <laughs> you know, either that or you're just outright deceived or you know that they're going to break it and you're just lying to yourself and lying to everybody else. Uh, one, of, one of those, uh, but, you know, it's crazy. But let me give you a couple of those quotes. Isra this is their attitude. Israel must vanish from the page of time. From the page of time, uh, um, I'm going to get some of these names wrong. Elatoyo Khomeini, 1979. Israel must be wiped off the map. Mohammed Amimajad, Amin, uh, 2005. You remember he was the president there. Wiped off the map. Israel has no cure but to be annihilated. Ali Kamir, 2014. I mean, these guys hate Israel wiped out like they're a disease there's no cure for them just wipe them out completely and yet here is Zacharias reminding the whole nation Israel that there's hope that the Messiah is coming the king to bring peace to the world if God will never forget the Jews he'll never forget you you're just as important as they are he loves you so much that he sent his son to die on the cross in your place he loves you enough to not only give you eternal life but to also give you life itself he's not forgotten he knows your struggles he knows your pains he knows the sufferings that you're going through even in your turmoils and difficulties God said he'll never leave you nor forsake you that's a promise of God that's a promise of God I remember when I first got saved I was so excited about the Lord my life just changed 180 degree turn it, it was just crazy I, I went from from living selfishly to living for Jesus. 
I was so high on Jesus, it was like I was snorting him all day long. I mean, I was just so excited for him all the time. And I remember that all of a sudden, one day, I always felt him close to me. I could sense him. I could hear his voice so clearly. That's what I love about my relationship with him. And one day, I couldn't hear him anymore. It's like, oh, where are you? I I'm not hearing you. What's going on over here? What's going on over there? I don't sense you. I started freaking out. Because it's like having your spouse by your side all your life, and then she's gone. And all of a sudden, the Lord reminded me, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I've said it in my word. So now you have to believe it. And so I had to literally tell that to myself constantly. Okay, he's right here with you. You don't feel him, but he's right here because he said it in his word that he'll never leave you or forsake you. And so once I had victory over that sensation of him not being there, all of a sudden it came back. Because the Lord taught me that he's always there and he'll never leave us or forsake us. That's a promise that he has for us. <clears throat> we had probably about 80 or so flyers left over for the, for the sunrise service. And so I thought we got to pass those out. We, we can't let it go to waste. We spent God's money on it. And so to pay for them and then throw them in the trash is ridiculous. And so I thought I'm going out there, even with my hip injury and knowing that I could probably go maybe... 15 to 18 minutes walking on it until I start hurting that I still have to do it I'll just suffer and so I went out Saturday me and Carlos and we started passing out uh, these flyers house to house door to door and car to car if we saw cars and and we passed out a, a good number and I actually got my phone and I timed myself because I know how much time I have before I start to hurt 21 minutes went by and I was hurting I was hurting but you know what it was worth it it was worth it in serving the Lord because I know that he never leaves me or forsakes me, that he loves me. And though I may have pain for a little while, you know, he took care of the pain forever because he's given me eternal life. Let's turn to John and see the fulfillment of this in the life of Jesus. John chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 12 through 15. Now, John is the one that quotes Zacharias 9.9 more accurately than any of the other Gospels, and so that's why we're turning here to get a clearer picture. <clears throat> but we're going to see Jesus entering into Jerusalem, fulfilling that prophecy. So it says in John 12, verse 12, The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Historians tell us that 256 thousand lambs were slain you could have up to 10 people per lamb so you can imagine one to two million people coming into jerusalem to celebrate the passover it's a lot of lambs it's a lot of blood it's a lot of sacrifices for the sins of israel but this was the time that they celebrated the passover a cleansing of their sins a washing away and a focus on god now feasts can get rather boring right I don't know if you're into tradition or not, but traditions can get boring. Uh, there are certain traditions that we do every year, like birthday parties. And sometimes there's birthday parties you don't want to go to. I've been to that birthday party before. I know what that birthday party is about. I don't want to go. I just want to stay indoors. I want to just relax. You know, I don't need to go. I went last time. Can I just stay indoors? You know, we, we kind of get comfortable, you know, at, at feast time, and, and we, we don't really want to get involved anymore. Yeah, it's kind of like church. I've been there already every Sunday. I go every Sunday. I go every Wednesday night. You know, why do I have to go every day? And, and we can get <coughs> lax with it. And we're not as excited as we were in the beginning uh, when we first came to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But when they heard Jesus was there, they were like, what? Jesus is going? You mean a guy that's been healing everyone? You mean the Messiah? They're calling him the Messiah? Oh, we got to go see this. <laughs> you know, everybody came out. They got out from being a hermit. They, they unlocked their doors, you know. Uh, they, they weren't watching the Passover on TV. <laughs> they actually went out, and they wanted to see what was going on. They were actually participating in this event. If Jesus does that to you, when all of a sudden you connect to Jesus, and you want to see Jesus work. That's why I love church. I don't miss church. I, I, I love being at church because I think if I miss church, the day that I miss church is the day that something happens, and I'm going to miss that. And I don't want to miss that. 
And there's been things that have happened that I've seen in this little church, miracles, and I'm glad I didn't miss it because I've seen God work in the lives of people, whether it was healings or restorations in relationships or people coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Those are things I don't want to miss. I don't want to be a, a hermit. I just don't want to stay home and, and do nothing, lock the doors and just be by myself. You know, I'm not really a social person. I don't like to get out. You know, we need to get out. We need to be social. We need to stop being hermits and we need to get to church. We need to get to church. Why? Because there's a temple to build. There's a temple to build. We are a part of the body of Christ and we need to build that temple. But our priorities are wrong, aren't they? We set different priorities. If we're to buy a regal ticket for the movies and we want to see a movie that starts at 410, we usually sh show up there about 4 o'clock to possibly 410 because we know there's going to be a, a couple of previews and then the movie. <laughs> but we don't show up after the movie starts, right? I don't know of anybody that shows up after the movie starts because it's a waste of money. Because a half an hour after the movie starts, you're going, what was this about? I missed the, the, the beginning of this. Oh, I got to see this all over again. We normally don't do that. But yet we can do that with church. We don't set priorities. We don't come to church expecting to worship the Lord. Because we're not here for me. We're not here for one another to a certain degree. We're here for Jesus. We're here to worship Jesus. We're here to give him psalms and praise just like they are as they hear that he's coming in. And so they're coming to throw their material things to him and praise him and sing to him asking for help and so forth for the oppression that they have in their lives but that's what we're here for but we don't approach church that way why because they're like feasts they're traditions we've gotten accustomed to it so we can be late it's okay they still have to love us and we do we do we still love you but church still needs to go on still needs to go on and people still need to be there I'm going to look at that for a second here because sometimes uh, we forget how important church is. And I'm going to give you the scripture that we hear all the time, and you've probably heard it. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25, right? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. You know, without wavering means don't waver to the right or the left. Stay on course. Don't give up. Keep going forward. For he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So we're here to stir up love, good works. We can't do that while you're at home and you're watching TV. You know, we can't stir you up to do good things. Uh, you're here to be equipped, Paul, Paul said. Uh, my job is to equip you for the work of the ministry, uh, to help you to get to church and to sit and to equip you to deal with life issues that are out there when we are serving the Lord. How do we deal with those things? By focusing on God, finding the mercies and the comfort from God, staying focused in the course with Him, trusting in Him, laying our cares and burdens before Him, knowing that He cares for us. These are the things we learn in church as we're here, but we can't learn it when we're somewhere else. Well, I can learn it from the TV. Yeah, you can to a certain degree, but you're not interacting with human beings. You're not touching iron sharpens iron, so the contents one man to another. You know, and sometimes we can rub each other wrong, and that's good because then we can learn to work through those things too. And we don't like that, though, because that's change. But we need to stir each other for good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. That's pretty clear, I think, when Paul said, do not forsake the assemblings of ourselves together. And then he goes on and says, as is the manner of some. Some people are doing this. They're forsaking the fellowship. They only come once a month. I'm sorry, I'm getting on some people. Once in a while, only on Easter Sundays, <laughs> Passion Week and so forth. Look, Paul wants you in church all the time. He says, look, you need to not forsake the assemblings of one another. Now, I've heard the excuses, the rationalization. Well, you know, when I'm in the, in the mall and I meet a brother, hey, we're fellowshipping together. We're, we're kind of fellowshipping, talking about the Lord. So that's assembling together in a certain degree. That's not what he's talking about. Well, when I go to a home Bible study, you know, we're together. Well, yeah, okay, to a certain degree, but that's still not what he's talking about. The assembling of one another together as a body of christ right? it functions together paul talks about the body being the body of christ being a body a literal body and it functions together every part of our body works together right but some parts may like the real church may want to not be a part of the body for whatever reasons can you imagine if all of a sudden your arm says you know what i just don't like this body <laughs> falls off and goes 
laying on the ground and just, you know, now you got a horror movie, the iron coming after people. You know, and it's like, I don't like it. So that doesn't function right, though. Every part has to function together. My fingers, my nails, my hairs, everything works together for a reason. Less the hair, because it's getting less, so I don't know there's <laughs> lack of a reason there. <laughs> but it functions together, so every part is important to the other parts of the body of Christ. That's what Paul is talking about here, but that's still not enough, because I've used that quite often to encourage people to be in church and to be in church on time and it doesn't seem to work it's the connecting to christ that's what's missing it's the relationship and the importance and the gratefulness that we have for what he has done for us you know there are people that serve here and serve at churches you know all over the world and they're marthas and they're great people they love the Lord and they serve the Lord and they're always serving the Lord. They're in the first service, they're in the second service, they're in the third service, they're out there serving and, and they're doing a wonderful job and we need servants, definitely need servants. We're missing here, we need teachers. We don't have enough teachers. Virginia is one of them, she's a Martha, she's always serving, she's never really in here like a Mary worshiping the Lord. So <laughs> once in a while on a Wednesday night because I think Martha has stepped in to take Wednesday nights for her, so she'll come in on Wednesday nights and sit finally. But she should be here Sunday mornings. Those Marthas are good. We need those people. We need greeters. We need greeters to greet people here. We need people to park people. Uh, we need people that are aware of those that are visiting here. We had a visitor last couple of times, no connection at all. We, s we, we spend money to, to send out flyers so that we can hit people's homes when they move into the area and we invite them to church. Well, this person came because of that. But when she got here, no connection. She was just gone and out. So a waste of money there, I think. You know, but we need to connect, and, and I try to connect there, so we're trying to change that a little bit. We need someone that says, hey, I see that need, and I want to meet that need. I, I want to see who is here, who's normally here, and then who is visiting, and then connect with that person and make them feel at home. That's how the body of Christ encourages uh, one another. That's how it grows uh, concerning one another. But we need those Marthas, but we also need to be Marys. We need to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. We need to be here being equipped for this ministry here and for this church and the direction that God is leading this church. Now, I'm saying all this because it, it seems to be here in the text, I think, <laughs> unless I'm pulling it out a little bit. <laughs> but I think there's a need here because this body has so much potential. We can do so much more if the whole body, if I guarantee you, if every one of us were doing something in this church, it'd be, we'd be amazed at what God would be doing here. But it's always a few. We have three guys, four guys that will come here and pretty much set the whole place up and tear the whole place down at the end. We need more guys to help in that. There's a need there. Uh, we have people that come in, and they definitely get food, and they're from the community and so forth, but that's all they're here for is food. They're not connecting to Christ. There's more to life than food, Jesus says. you got to connect to Christ. You need to be here because of Jesus, not because of the food. Yeah, it's great that you get some food, and you can get you know, your needs met, but you need to understand God has a purpose for your life too. Uh, today's not one of those days for food, so they're not all here. But they need to be here every Sunday. Yeah, I'm here when I, get, when I need food, but what about the other days? Why aren't you here? Well, I don't need food. Okay, so then why are you here? You're not connecting to Christ. You need to connect. Martha's a good, but we need Mary sitting down. <laughs> Let me give you another scripture. This might help you a little bit more to see the importance of being in church. Luke 4, 16, write it down. It's talking about Jesus Christ. It says, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. So Jesus came to Nazareth, his hometown, where he was raised. This was where he lived, his community. He knew the people. It's where he drove his chariot throughout the community, went shopping and so forth. This is where Jesus dwelt. And it says in verse 16, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. It was his custom. He did this regularly every Sabbath day. He was in church. Now we call ourselves Christians, which means we're Christ-like. 
Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a relationship in that we claim to be like Christ. And if we claim to be like Christ, then we see him going to church every Sunday, as was his custom. So how much more should we be going to church? We should be just like him. It should be exciting to go to church, to wait and see what God is going to do that day. And on this particular day, they actually asked Jesus to say something. And that was when he opened up the scrolls to Isaiah and said, today this this scripture is fulfilled. Wow. Can you imagine that? One day, if you're here every Sunday, I might ask you to say something. Wouldn't that be scary? (laughs) Yeah, it would be really scary. For some of you, no, it wouldn't be scary at all. Steve, where's Steve? Steve wouldn't be scared at all. <clears throat> this is only going to appeal to those who really want to sit at the feet of Jesus, to really sit at the feet of Jesus and just take in and learn from him so that we can grow. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul was accustomed to teaching on the Sundays. It says, now on the first day of the week, When the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to part the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. First day of the week, Sunday morning, Paul gave a message to the people before he left on Monday. The apostles understood Sunday was important. And so gathering together and hearing a message and being equipped for the work of the ministry is important. And he went all the way till midnight teaching the word of God. And drop down to verse 9 if you'd like. That was Acts chapter 20, verse 7. But uh, here we go. They, he was teaching all day. And it says that in the window sat a certain young man who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continues speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. This sounds like he's speaking about church, right? Because he was falling asleep in church. It's okay to fall asleep in church. (laughs) At least you're in church. And you know what? Something might happen. You might fall over dead. And here's the exciting thing. God may resurrect you from the dead because Paul went out there and touched him and he resurrected from the dead. That would be exciting. And you would have missed it if you would have stayed home and slept. Come to church and sleep. We get it all the time. I see it all the time. It doesn't bother me at all. Years ago, we had one guy who actually ran the sound. He was sleeping most of the time. One day he was so gone, his head actually hit the wall. Boom! Woke everybody else up. (laughs) That's church. (laughs) That's church. God wants us in church first, sitting at the feet of Jesus, being equipped, and then getting busy with building the kingdom. That's what Zacharias was talking about. Comforting them to build the kingdom of God. But first you have to sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, picture in your minds tens of thousands of lambs being brought to Jerusalem, being slaughtered. Uh, Blood that was just splattered all within the temple and and splattered upon the horns of the altar as they gave up sacrifices and offerings unto the Lord. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of all this, choosing, inspecting of the lambs, the bleeding, you know, of the land, and so forth, here comes the Lamb of God, Jesus himself, walking into the city of Jerusalem. And it was on the sixth day of Nisan, that he walked in on that day, 500 and so years after Zacharias prophesied. Well, how do we know that? <clears throat> how do we know that Jesus walked in on that day? Well, you can calculate it from Daniel chapter 9, and I'm not going to get into that, but really quickly, if you look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 26, he talks about 70 weeks. And how you calculate that to the exact day that Jesus would ride into Jerusalem. He talks about the 70 weeks needing to be, the 70 weeks was the full weeks, but the 69 weeks was when Jesus walked in, and the seventh week is still yet to be fulfilled, which is the tribulation period. But during that time, that 69 weeks, when Jesus enters in, that's when he's going to deal with, as as Daniel 9.24 says, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation of iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy. Who's that speaking of? Jesus. The Lamb of God who'd enter in. The, the term weeks there is a common Jewish term, and it literally means seven years, not literally weeks, a week. It's talking about years. And they get that from Leviticus 25, 3 through 4. When they would buy a piece of land, they were to use it for six years, but on the seventh year, they were to let it rest. 
that one year, and they called it a week, the seventh week, a whole year. So when you calculate the first seven years, which is 49 Hebrew years, 62 weeks, which would be 434 years, and then the one last week, which is a seven-year tribulation period, you take the seven and the 62, which comes out to 69 weeks, and you calculate it, and you come up with the sixth day of Nisan, or April, which is our Palm Sunday. And that was the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem. They took branches of, of palm trees and they met him there and they began to cast them before Jesus Christ. Now they did this in celebration and also in expectation. It's something that they did during the time at, of Antiochus Epiphany who came in to the temple and desecrated by slaughtering a pig. And the Maccabee brothers uh, revolted and were able to uh, take that situation under control to a certain degree and so as they were waving the palm branches they were remembering that victory over the oppression of that time and they were hoping that maybe Jesus could give them victory over the oppression of the Roman government at their time and today we go to Jesus when we're oppressed by the enemy or oppressed by any other thing we cast all our cares on him or our burdens on him because he cares for us we hold on to him not not to <clears throat> deliver us from Obama, not to deliver us from this government, but to deliver us from the evil one, Satan himself, to deliver us from our flesh and give us victory so that we can walk a victorious life in Christ Jesus, so that we can have the peace that he came to bring. And Jesus is here, and they shouted out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Again, another Psalms, Psalms 118.25, that they would shout out in praise. Uh, something that they did continually before the Lord. The word Hosanna means save now. And again, they were looking for Jesus to save them from the Roman government as the early Christians were looking for someone to rise up against Antiochus Epiphany. We're looking for eternal salvation today. That's not important to people. We don't look at life that way. We look at life in a duration of time and, and we try to live it the fullest as we can. Let's grab as much as we can and enjoy as much as we can and have as much fun as we can because we'll die one day. But we don't think about the future. What about after that? What happens after that? That eternal life. Is it true that there's a heaven? Is it true there's a hell? Where am I going? Jesus came to save us from that because it is our sins that will send us to hell if we continue to live in sin. Or we can give him our sins he can take our sins and wash us by his blood. And we'll be saved. And he'll bring us peace. Look at verse 14. Jesus, Then Jesus, when he had found the young donkey, he sat on it as it was written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey colt. And so again, this is the quotation from Zacharias 9, 9. Behold, your king is coming. He is just in having salvation in his hand. Reason for a donkey and not a horse, because Jesus came in peace. The horse is coming later, where he will come to fight the battle and war, and we'll be with him. But right now, he brings peace to us. Jesus brings us that peace. Do you have that peace of God? Do you have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, or are you still oppressed? Are you still troubled? Are you still, still dealing with the situations in your life and not able to handle them because you have no peace? God wants to bring you peace because he's the prince of peace. How does that work, to have peace in the midst of turmoils? I remember that analogy that I saw is a picture of this great big storm hitting rocks. You, some of you may have seen this. And, and you see the ocean, and you see these hard rocks, and the water's just slamming up against the rocks. You go, wow, that's, that's, that's radical. That's like the wedge, just boom, 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 just coming against it. And as you zoom into the picture, you see there are holes in the rocks. And as you get closer and closer, there's two little birds, and they're sitting in, in the cracks of the rocks, and they're just chirping away in all peace. So how can they have that peace while the storm is going on? Because they're in the center of the rock, and Jesus is our rock. He's our rock. We need to trust in him. He has us in the palm of his hand. He knows what tomorrow brings, and so we can depend on him to take care of us. I know it may be difficult at times to go through what we go through, so we start drinking. We start 
taking drugs to handle it, to get our mind off of it. Why don't you try serving the Lord? That's always alternative. Get busy serving the Lord. You, you take your mind off of things when you're doing something. When, when you're sitting there cleaning the chairs, you're thinking about cleaning the chairs as best as you can, and you're not thinking about your troubles and worries. But you're thinking about cleaning that chair so someone can sit in it and enjoy it for someone else. It's not self-centered. And it takes your mind off of those things. And then all of a sudden, God answers those things. As I said earlier, it's just amazing how God takes care of stuff. I've seen him take care of that stuff all the time. And so I know he'll take care of it always, always. Virginia got really sick last night. She had this massive migraine headache. The back of her neck was just tight, and her body started aching. So there I am, like, okay, what, I, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? You know, so I started massaging her neck and her head and getting right down by the cranium there and so forth and just really digging in. And she, no, nah, it's too hard. And, get, you know, just kept trying. And she finally found a spot where she could just lay. And I kept telling her, don't worry, this is going to pass. This is going to pass. Don't worry, this is going to pass. You'll be fine in the morning. <laughs> but, boy, she, she was hurting last night. And it's difficult to see someone you love go through that because you're like, how can I help you? And I can't help you. But Jesus was there. I prayed for her. And she got through it. And by the morning, she was fine. She was fine. It's going to pass. And sometimes we have to view life that way. This will pass. This will be gone. And then we'll hit the next one, knowing that Jesus is there with us. Jesus appeared to the disciples after the resurrection. Can you imagine? Jesus walking with Jesus for three years or so. And then watching him be crucified and then buried in the ground. And then all of a sudden, he appears to you. And he says to the disciples, peace to you. <laughs> that would be something. That would change your whole attitude, right? Wait a minute. Weren't you just dead? Were you in the grave? Wasn't there a big stone before your tomb? And, and now you say peace to you? Yeah, wow. There's nothing you can't do, right? Oh, you, can't, you can take care of all my problems, worries, and cares. Oh, I'm, totally, I'm totally at peace, whatever happens. And that's why they went off and died as martyrs for the Lord. They were able to understand Absent from these bodies is present with the Lord. So there's no fear at all. No fear at all of even death itself. Zacharias in his prophecy, when he prophesied about the Lord, he said uh, concerning the light that he came to those who were sitting in darkness and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. To the way of peace. Jesus has brought peace to us. He wants us to live in peace. What's stopping you from the peace of God. It's your flesh. It's your sins. That's what's stopping you. See, sin is work. It's hard to maintain sin. There's repercussions to sin. That's death, the Bible says. And so you are dying every time you sin. And so there's just a battle. And it's a fight all the time that you're sinning. It never stops. But when you give that sin up, and you just trust in Christ and serve Him, that battle seems to go away. And God just seems to take your life and just help you along the way with more peace. Or it's the flesh, this body with all its desires and its wants and hungers. If you just crucify it, God will lead you into that peace. But you keep giving in to it, there's all kinds of repercussions. If you're into food like me, you know, and you just keep giving in to that gluttony, then eventually things don't fit anymore. And you're like, ah, and you're always talking about your weight. Things don't fit in your pants. Now I go buy another pair of pants or dig up the old pair. And it's just a lot of, you know, struggling instead of just being at peace, giving that up, having a well-balanced diet, you know. Stop it. Give it up for the Lord. I don't know if you read this in the recorder yesterday, the California Lions friends uh, they took up a donation of used eyeglasses, prescription eyeglasses. So they took up a donation. I guess people can't afford eyeglasses, so they took up this donation. You can donate your old eyeglasses to them. Well, over 500 pairs were donated. They were stolen. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? F there are 500 people out there driving Harupa Valley. Be careful because they don't have glasses right now. You know, you'll be warned. They're without glasses. Folks, do you see what I'm saying? Because sometimes we get blinded. We're not seeing what the Lord is trying to say to us. 
when we come to church and we sit, we should expect God to talk to us, minister to us, correct us, equip us, help us to be better in our relationships with one another and our own family members and so forth. He wants to minister to us. Don't be blinded. Don't be blinded. Don't let the enemy rip you off. What is God saying to me this morning? What is he saying? He, he's saying, cast your cares on him and get busy building the temple. Get involved. If all of us were to get involved, this church would be totally different. It would be a lot bigger. More of the community, community would be aware of it. Uh, we need people to help putting up signs. We put signs up throughout the community, but there's one guy that goes around and puts them up. If a couple of guys decide that, hey, I'd like to help out Sunday morning, go out there and just boom, boom, put them in the ground. You're done. Pick them up afterwards. That's it. That would help get people here. There are quite a few people here who came here because of those signs. Those are opportunities. If this church were to tithe like it should, we would have so much more going on. Tithes is the Lord's. The Bible's very clear. It's not our money. It's God's money. And we're stealing from him, Malachi says, when we don't give him our 10th percent. That's the amount that just goes without seeing anything. Most people give because they want to see something. And it's been wonderful to see what God has been doing. I mean, new TVs, new monitors, new soundboards. These are great, and we're really appreciative of all those offerings for the Lord. I mean, obviously, it, it's, it's making the worship sound better, and we're able to come in and just really focus on the Lord. Uh, pretty soon, someone just donated a whole jungle gym for the kids, you know, so they're going to have a slide with swings and a uh, house and rock climbing kind of thing. I mean, that's wonderful, and we see the results of our giving. But tithes, we don't see the results because that's for the temple. That goes to support the work of God in this church. Anything above that goes for the other things that we're trying to do, like the summer fest, the outreach this coming Sunday, the celebration. We've got to purchase all the food and so forth. But if we were to all give God what's already His, as the size of our church, we would be doing a lot better, a lot better. See, God wants us to be busy building the kingdom, be busy building the temple. That's why Zacharias encouraged the people. Stop focusing on the situation. Yeah, your land is devastated, but focus on building the temple, and eventually God will restore everything. I remember reading an article on the uh, Hiroshima bomb in Japan, and when they dropped it, and then um, hearing a that article tying in with the Katrina storm. And to this day, you look at Katrina, it's still devastated. But you look at the Hiroshima place, they have rebuilt the whole place. And it's like beautiful. Why? Because they just stayed focused on rebuilding. They stayed focused on what the perspective was, is we need to rebuild, get people back in here, start working, creating taxes, and building a city. Katrina is like, get everyone out, leave it alone. We're not going to put no money in it. And it's still there to this day. It's a difference in our perspective. Get busy building the kingdom of God. Here's a model to live by. 1 Peter 3, 11. Let him turn away from sin or evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. You want peace? Then pursue peace. Pursue peace and God will give you that peace. He said he's come to overcome the world and give you a peace that the world cannot give you. This world will not give you true peace. Only Christ can give you that peace. So we start Passion Week with the triumphal entry of Jesus walking into Jerusalem with peace to save his people. This Wednesday, again, here we go. If the whole church was there, we would be packed on Wednesday night. This Wednesday, we're going to look at the three prayers of Jesus during his Passion Week. I believe the three prayers that were more, most important, not only for him, but for us as he prayed in the garden. So we'll look at that this coming Wednesday, and then Friday we'll look at the crucifixion of Christ. And then on Sunday, any of you ever ask the question why Jesus' resurrected body still had the marks on his hands and, and the hole in his side? Why didn't he get a new body? It's a good question. We'll talk about that on Sunday.